What's up everyone? Today, we're digging into the concept of exotic species. And before we head outdoors, we're gonna kick things off in the lab by clearing up a few things. What is a native species versus an exotic species? How do exotic species wind up in a place like South Florida? And what makes certain exotic species invasive? Humans aren't the only species that make South Florida, quote, exotic. In many ways, this subtropical paradise can be pretty harsh, but with technology like air conditioning and mosquito repellent, we've adapted. And we've also made nature adapt to us. You might say that we are the ultimate exotic invasive species here. Other organisms from tropical and subtropical climates around the world, however, have found ecosystems like the Everglades to be just as hospitable or even more so than their native habitats. A native species is a plant or animal that has become established in an ecosystem over a long period of time. Many of these may have migrated here naturally. Emphasis on natural. Take a lot of our tropical orchids, like the ghost orchid. This species likely came over from Cuba, its dust-like seeds blowing over on hurricane winds hundreds of years ago. Today, we consider the ghost orchid to be a native species. The key factors are that the process was natural, and it's been here a long time. How long does a species have to be here to be considered native? Well, that's a topic for debate. South Florida's subtropical climate has become a comfortable home to a wide variety of invaders. We find them in practically any body of water, whether it be fresh or marine. Some we just take for granted as if they've always been here. Exotic species are plants or animals that are non-native. Some are relatively harmless to the ecosystem, while others can significantly modify or disrupt the ecosystem they colonize. Those exotics are referred to as invasive species. Invasive species displace the native ones, outcompeting them for resources and disrupting the natural web of life in the Everglades or whatever ecosystem they've invaded. There are a lot of factors that determine whether an exotic species becomes invasive. Perhaps it's uniquely evolved to hunt or hide or defend itself, to take advantage of the available landscape and native prey. Perhaps the new community lacks certain parasites that the organism might be a host for in its native range. So how do these exotic and invasive exotic species get here? Well, lots of ways. Humans have covered the earth and we're constantly traveling and trading from far-flung regions all over the planet. Often we bring baggage, some unintentional, some intentional. The feral cat, believe it or not, is one of the most consequential. Cats kill at least 1.4 billion birds in the US each year. Think about that. That purring fluff ball in your lap, it's a killing machine. Hitchhiking insects or plant seeds often wind up here in shipments of produce. Some are imported on purpose. Plants are a great example. If you live in South Florida, just walk outside and look at your landscaping. Chances are that palm tree is from South America or Southeast Asia. One of our worst invasive species is an Australian tree called Malaluco, which has completely taken over thousands of acres of Everglades marsh. Seeds of this tree were actually spread to try to dry out marshy areas in South Florida, and today you can see what a problem it's become. Many of our most famous exotic species came here through the pet trade, becoming established after escaping or being intentionally released by irresponsible owners. So if you're dying to get a pet, do your research and be responsible. Make sure you know the behavior and the needs of the animal and are prepared to love it and own it for its entire life. If you're not up to the task, don't get it. Simple as that. When you think of invasive species, your mind probably turns to large reptilian predators like the Burmese python or the Argentine black and white tegu. They get all the attention. But you don't have to be big to cause big problems. And today, we're starting small. The zebra long-winged butterfly is a beautiful native of Florida. In fact, it's the state butterfly, but they face a new threat, wasmania. 
the little fire ant. For this Central American species, butterfly eggs and larvae are easy targets. Often called the electric ant, this tiny insect can give humans a painful bite. For butterflies, they're an existential threat. The zebra longwing isn't the only beautiful native in trouble. South Florida is home to a number of flashy tree snails, some endangered. The liguous tree snail was once almost hunted to extinction by humans that collected them for their gorgeous shells. Today, they're hunted by a new invader. This isn't just any worm. This is the New Guinea flatworm, and it's terrifying. If you're a snail, at least. The New Guinea flatworm is a large threat to these liguous tree snails. They actually start at the base of the trees and they follow the trails that the tree snail leaves as they crawl up or come down the trees, eventually finding the tree snails and eating them. First discovered in Florida in 2012, this invasive predator has had a quick, devastating impact on our native snail communities. Hammocks, which once hosted thriving populations of tree snails, including the gorgeous liguous tree snails, have become graveyards of empty shells. But there is another slithery invader that has become infamous in South Florida. Python, python, right there, right there. The Burmese python. Growing as long as 19 feet, the hungry constrictor can give the alligator a run for its money. All right, what number is this? 299. 299. What's worse? They're spreading and eating just about anything that moves. Yeah, the Burmese python. Um, it is just an absolutely fascinating creature. Uh, for it to have taken over an ecosystem that's pretty harsh. Um, I call these Florida Burmese pythons. They're not Burmese pythons anymore. They basically are top apex predators uh, that have learned the environment in and out and uh, just taken over. You know, they have to be amazing to be able to do that. The Burmese python problem is a human problem. Escape pets have now become invasive predators and it takes a special kind of hunter to remove them from this embattled ecosystem. It's a good thing Donna has assembled a team of python prodigies she calls the Everglades Avengers. Yep, got it. Yep. The majority of the time, you're not gonna see the whole snake. So when I'm trying to spot a python, I'm just trying to use my brain's ability to do pattern recognition. And I'm actually looking for that pattern on the skin. That's 90% of the spots I, when I spot a python, that's what I spot is that pattern. Kevin is an experienced herper with an amazing ability to spot pythons, and he's caught a ton. In fact, he's shattered the record for most Burmese pythons caught in a single month. I moved from Indiana to Florida about a year and a half ago with the sole purpose of figuring out how to become a python hunter. And Amy has figured it out all right. In that time, she's caught just over 100 pythons including this 17 foot three inch monster all by herself. One of the hardest parts about hunting the pythons is that we have to euthanize them. They're beautiful, fascinating and amazing creatures and it's not their fault that they're here. If that's the case, then we should do everything we can to use as much of the python as we possibly can so they don't go to waste, so they don't rot in a pile somewhere. Python hunting and high fashion don't often go in the same sentence. Amy, however, has teamed up with B. Swanky, a local brand that is fashioning designer handbags out of the skins of pythons removed from the Everglades. A portion of their proceeds supports the work of the Alliance for Florida's National Parks, a win-win if you ask me. As of 2020, licensed contractors like Amy, Kevin, and Donna have caught over 5,000 Burmese pythons in the Everglades but they do it with a little help from their friends. And I couldn't pass up the chance to give it a try. There you go. Woohoo! That, folks, is exciting. Even my daughter's scout tagged along. 
I've had almost 200 volunteers um, that have helped me spot, catch, bag, and remove from the Everglades. And Scout is going to be the youngest that I've ever taken out. She's five years old. That's the age that I was when I fell in love with snakes. So it's going to be kind of a cool, cool thing tonight. For the record, Scout did have fun, but it was a bit past her bedtime. Scout's just waking up from a nap, everyone. <laughs> My buddy Mike Lorette loves reptiles of all kinds. For a herpetology enthusiast, this is a great place to live and work. Here in South Florida, we are extremely privileged to be the only place in the world where both crocodiles and alligators live in the same areas and coexist in the wild. Not long ago, Florida's American croc population was on the verge of collapse. Fortunately, they have rebounded thanks to important conservation measures. Mike is in charge of studying and monitoring crocodiles at Turkey Point Clean Energy Center, which has become an important nesting site. It's never a dull day at the office, and tonight, I get to lend him a hand. One, two, three. Crocodiles have come such a long way here in South Florida, and when you look at potential threats to them as a species, you think about things such as invasive species. A threat like the tegu that could potentially impact the crocodiles before they even hatch could pose a big time threat to the American crocodiles here in South Florida. The Argentine black and white tegu is gorgeous. It is also an invasive, opportunistic predator. The tegu is no match for a big croc, but here's the problem. This sneaky lizard loves eggs, all kinds of eggs. We have evidence that tegus actually prey upon alligator eggs. Because there are a lot more alligators, we tend to find more tegus eating alligator eggs. However, because they have a taste for those eggs, we know that they can become a direct threat to the American crocodile. So here at Turkey Point, we have an invasive animal management program where we try to eradicate all these invasive species and keep our lovely native crocodiles protected. As a biologist, Mike uses every instrument at his disposal to monitor croc nests. Camera traps have proved to be a valuable tool. Not only do the images capture important clues about the nesting behavior of the crocodiles, but they give Mike a snapshot of other important native species that are using the habitat as well as exotic species that might pose a problem. And the tegu isn't the only creature of concern. Green iguanas often burrow into the same nesting mound that a female crocodile uses. This could potentially expose the eggs or cause the nest to collapse. Whether we brought them here accidentally, like the Wasmania ant and the New Guinea flatworm, or on purpose, like the Burmese python, the Argentine tegu, and the green iguana. Most of the invasive species we've looked at today are here because of us. Thankfully, we have science and technology on our side. With the right tools, good data, and lots of hard work, we might just be able to get a handle on Florida's invasive exotics. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Now, get out, explore, and remember, leave only footprints. I'll catch you next time. Yeah, it's actually a, a pretty big one. I wish I had my other glove on. <laughs> uh, not just yet, but let's see what we got here. Let's bring him up to the, to the levee. Ah, yep, he's a big one. Woo!